Good evening. My name is Tyler Warman, and I'm a senior here at Hillsdale College studying politics, and I'm from Anaheim, California. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Arn. Larry P. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College, where he is also a professor of history and politics. He received his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied at Wooster College, Oxford University, where he served as director of research for Sir uh, Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. From 1985 to 2000, he served as president of the Claremont Institute for the study of statesmanship and political philosophy. He serves on several boards of directors, and he previously served on the U.S. Army War College Board of Visitors for two years, for which he earned the Department of the Army's Outstanding Civilian Service Medal. In 2015, he received the Bradley Prize from the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. A member of numerous organizations, including the Churchill Center, he is the author of three books, Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, the Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It, and most recently, Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government. Please join me in welcoming our President, Dr. Larry Arn. How you doing? Good luck. What do you major in? Politics. What is that? Politics. What is it? What do you mean? What is politics? What is politics? Politics, the uh, study of what government we are. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. I just asked Tyler, a senior, what he majors in, and he said politics, and I asked him what that is, and he doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually a little hard to define if you're a kid. Good job. Tyler's a fine young man, very smart. I shouldn't make fun of him in front of all of you, but that's what I do for a living. Um, thank you, Andrew, Minnie, Robert, and Richard, who's all spoken beautifully this week, and I'm so proud to have them here. Thank you, Doug and Tim and Matt, for organizing this conference, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, Doug, who orders me about for a living, has assigned me to talk about peace and Churchill, so I'm going to begin with a story about war. The, uh, the reason I begin with this story is that what I, it's what I first learned about Churchill, and uh, a lot of young people here, and they should learn it too. In 1977, I was a graduate student, and I was house-sitting for a man who had written his doctoral thesis on Winston Churchill and the house was full of Churchill books. And I had a very tough boxer dog, my first one by the name of Thor, aptly named, and I had not yet met Penny, and so there was no one to make the dog sweet. And so this dog was always getting in dog fights, which I was very proud that he won. I've learned better than that now under the tutelage of my wife. But uh, I was bitten by this dog. I have a scar right here. I'll show it to you after if you want to see it. I like it a lot because uh, I was laid up. My hand swelled up real big. And uh, I had uh, stuff from the vet to treat puncture wounds in dogs because this dog was getting in dog fights. And so I just treated myself with that stuff. And uh, I was laid up. And there were these Churchill books there. And I started reading them. That was what I could reach. And I'm going to read you the first paragraph I ever read. It was the custom in the palmy days of Queen Victoria, this is the beginning of Churchill's world crisis, in my opinion, his second greatest book. It's about the First World War. It was the custom in the palmy days of Queen Victoria for statesmen to expatiate upon the glories of the British Empire and to rejoice in that protecting providence which had preserved us through so many dangers. and brought us at last into a secure and prosperous age. Little did they know 
that the worst perils had still to be encountered and that the greatest triumphs were yet to be won. Ooh, I thought, a drama. Wow. Then another surprise on the next page. Churchill the warrior, the famous warrior, did not describe war as a march of glory. Here's a passage. The great war through which we have passed differed from all ancient wars in the immense power of the combatants and their fearful agencies of destruction, and from all modern wars in the utter ruthlessness with which it was fought. All the horrors of the ages were brought together, and not only armies, but whole populations were thrust into the midst of them. No truce or parley mitigated the strife of the armies. The wounded died between the lines. The dead moldered into the soil. Merchant ships and neutral ships and hospital ships were sunk on the seas, and all on board left to their fate or killed as they swam. Every effort was made to starve whole nations into submission without regard to age or sex. Cities and monuments were smashed by artillery. Bombs from the air were cast down indiscriminately. Poison gas in many forms stifled or seared the soldiers. Liquid fire was projected upon their bodies. When all was over, torture and cannibalism were the only two expedients that the civilized, scientific, and Christian states had been, un had been able to deny themselves, and these were of doubtful utility. Now, the first thing we need to do is understand how remarkable this passage is, and I can do the unfair thing of casting it in relief. Have you ever read a book written by a politician? I mean the ones that uh, they make millions of dollars to write and somebody else writes and nobody reads. The travelogues of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> the adventures in Senate deals of Robert Dole. This is really unfair, but I think I may know the worst in history of the genre. It would be the memoirs of Mikhail Gorbachev, which actually contains this sentence. And I promise to all my colleagues in the college that I'm not making it up. He's describing one of his own speeches in his memoirs. I started off like Hamlet's famous soliloquy. Now a quote from the speech. How to deepen and make irreversible revolutionary perestroika, which on the initiative and under the leadership of the party has been launched in our country, this is the fundamental question. <laughs> now, now, I'm going to give myself away because, of course, I have not read this book, and neither has anyone else. But P.J. O'Rourke has reviewed the book, <laughs> and he writes in response to this claim that this speech was like Hamlet, to which, if I remember my Shakespeare, Ophelia replies, Sweet Prince, take your Prozac. <laughs> I bet you money P.J. O'Rourke has never read that book. Surely not. But Churchill wrote that that I just read. He wrote 50 books like that. His speeches published are over 8,000 single space pages and we know of three or four of those pages that he did not write. And they're all like that. Can you write like that? Can you write like that and fight in the two greatest wars in history as a leader? Can you write like that and go through the Great Depression? Never been anybody like that. Nobody ever did that except him. People who write about him, if they don't absorb that obvious and first fact, they have not seen the forest, only the trees are apparent to them. Now, I'm going to interrupt my argument, such as it is, and draw conclusions along the way. I'm going to draw four, and this is the first one. The classics teach us 
that we all have to meet our testing place, to use a phrase that I heard Steve Smith speak, say at Convocation, in action and through a faculty called prudence. Why do we need this faculty? What is it? First of all, we all have principles, don't we? We're not like the dogs, and certainly not like the dogs that Penny and I are owned by. When we do something, we question it later. And before we do it, we question it. We have these principles and they stand outside what we do and they call what we do into question. And on the other hand, we have to do. And we have to do amid circumstances. And what we do depends very much on what the circumstances are. Churchill wrote in two beautiful places in separate places. One, that there were some things you could never do in war, ever like abandon the Greeks when the, Nazi, when the Germans attacked them. And then in another place, when he's writing about the Duke of Marlborough a long time ago, he says, uh, circumstances alone decide what is right to do in war. And the faculty that arbitrates between them is this rational faculty called practical judgment. And we all need it. And it's, all, it's where we all, every difficult thing we do in our lives, we do using that faculty, and we find out what our characters are, and also we shape our characters by that faculty. Here at the college, we are trying to teach these young people about that specific thing. They have to understand the ultimates. That's the purpose of life, but you cannot understand them until you get your character in such a place as you can attend to them. And you do that by passing these tests. And the classic article, our authors who first wrote about this said, that the way to learn this is to look at people who have the re reputation for great statesmanship, because that reputation is very rare. Not many people can do it. And so if you meet somebody like that or learn of somebody like that, then you should read about them because they're making the very hardest choices, life and death choices. Churchill gave a speech on the 28th of May, 1940 in war, and Britain was about to quit the war and respond favorably to a peace conference proposal from Mussolini and he walked in the room. He was the prime minister. There wasn't anybody else who came in the room who would, would be even inclined to say what he said. And he said, after talking impromptu for an hour, I've been thinking in these last few days whether it is my duty to open negotiations with that man, meaning Hitler. And I believe that if I were for a moment to consider parley or surrender, every one of you would rise up and tear me down from my place. If this island story is to end at last, let it end when each of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. Amazing thing to say. And he turned the room around. And he turned the world around. There are people today who blame him for that speech. There wasn't anybody else in that room who could have made that speech or was wishing to make it. It was an act of prudence. And it was prudence because, did you read that passage? Did you hear that passage I read? The first thing I learned about this great man after I learned, wow, can he not write? I'm going to read more of that, I thought. And that was 40 some years ago and I still do. The second thing I learned was he was afraid of war, offended by it, thought that it had changed in scope. And he names the two ways in this passage how it changed. The first was, we have discovered somehow, or recovered somehow, the ruthlessness that happened in the ancient world when whole cities would be destroyed by, for example, the last time Alexander of Thebes, when all of the men were killed and the women and children were sold into slavery. We're doing things like that again. Except the difference now is we have powers that they did not have. We can destroy whole countries. We can put whole populations to war. Now the battles involve millions of people. It's possible, he writes in 1925 in an essay called, Shall We All Commit Suicide? Mankind has never been in this position before without having improved appreciably in virtue or enjoying wiser guidance. He's got into his hands at last the means of his own destruction. That's 1925. It's 1940 when he says, every one of us in this room is to fight. And yet he was afraid of the fighting. 
Don't you see what a rich problem that raises? That's huge. How are we conduct, to conduct ourselves in a world where civilization and the freedom upon which it lies, understand Churchill is systematic about this point. Civilization just really means civil, like the Roman Latin word, right? The things of the citizen, it means the rule of law. And if you have that, then freedom will grow. And from freedom will grow all of the greatnesses that we study here in this college. And the job is to protect that, and war can destroy it all. But so can Hitler. So what if you get yourself in a place where you gotta pick one or the other? He got in that place. And he said before he got there, I felt as if I were watching, walking with a destiny, and all my life had been but a preparation for this hour and this trial. I went to sleep and slept soundly without dreams, because sometimes facts are better than dreams. Do you see? He wanted to be there, but he took it seriously. It wasn't like, I just want the power. I want the test. I want to see if I can help to prove that human beings are capable of living well, even in this dangerous age. So then, if my first conclusion is, we who wish to guide our lives well wish to study a classic example of it. Here's one. My second is, Churchill was afraid of war all his life, from 1898 on. I said the reasons. We are the same being as we used to be, but we are massively more powerful now. And think what, what hell we can let loose. I was saying to somebody the other day, technology doesn't matter in war. It was last semester, actually. It was Mr. Danforth of the graduate school. I wonder if he's here tonight, idiot boy. And uh, he was saying, it doesn't change anything. And I said, no, nothing at all. It's September 11th, 2001, and uh, almost a dozen guys have trained like crazy, and they decide to make their assault on Manhattan, and they're carrying the weapons of the day. And the weapons of the day are clubs or bows and arrows. Would we remember September 11th, 2001? Churchill figured that out. My third conclusion is that, now I'll talk about peace. Because come to find out, it's the same thing. Churchill thought that this attitude, because see, there's two things going on. One is the power of natural science. Churchill loved that. One of his best friends was a physicist named Frederick Lindemann, whom he made a peer, and who was a very powerful man in the Second World War. And that tells you something, right? Because there are two things about Lindemann and Churchill. The first one is they needed a bunch of very powerful weapons to work so they could kill the Nazis because the Nazis were working on the same weapons. And Lindemann helped make that possible. So science was important because you had to have it. You can't give it up. And yet it's dangerous. But then the second point is even in a way more powerful, and that is he just loved this guy Lindemann because Lindemann could explain the world to him. Modern science is a way of beholding that is awesome in what it can show. If you want the best two examples I've ever seen on this campus, they are etched in my memory and I will never forget them. And you can go to our website tonight and watch them both. They're both convocation speeches. One is by the physicist, Ken Hayes, and one is by the chemist, Chris Van Orman. And they're awesome. And they just explain to you magical things that we have discovered about the universe that were unknown to the ancients in all their greatness, a new and powerful way of beholding. Churchill knew that and he loved that. But then there's this other thing about science that it does give all this power and it is accompanied by a different kind of philosophic doctrine that is very prevalent and not the doctrine that you will hear from professors Hayes and Van Orman. And that doctrine is we have come into our own at last, and we can conquer everything. And we have the tools of science to do it, and we can make the world however we want it to be. 
And if you just think through that claim for a minute and that claim, read the paper tomorrow and you will see some powerful person making just that claim. They'll make it about the environment or they'll make it about the family or they'll make it about income stratification or they'll make it about war or they'll make it about the thousand pressing topics that are up. And always it's true that whatever the, were the rules about those things in the past, we can repeal those rules by the power of science. And that means that a new kind of administration was born in Churchill's lifetime. And it's the scientific bureaucratic way. The standards of which are experimentation on the society. The Socialist Party comes into Great Britain in the British Parliament, wins its first seats in the year 1900. Guess what year Winston Churchill was elected to Parliament for the first time? And, you know, here's something for you young people. When Churchill was 26 years old, he had fought in four wars, one of them he really only observed. He distinguished himself in all of them. Every, what I mean by distinguished is he got mentioned in two of them in the dispatches. But also people there, soldiers, recorded that they looked at him and they went, wow, watch that guy. That guy is something, isn't he? He was deliberate on a battlefield. And he did it on purpose, so there are some records to show, so people would notice him and he could get elected to parliament. But then, you know, he would published, what, so three books, two of them bestsellers, and he was one of the most widely published and best known authors in England at, by, by 26 and then he got elected to parliament as a war hero. He was crazy. But in this novel that he wrote in 1898-99, Langworth's one always remembers the dates and then Harumph's because I don't. Um, that's, why, that's why we're important here, right? You do the dates, Richard. And, uh, and uh, he, he uh, um, and he writes in this novel, the novel is a romance, it's called Severola, you should read it because it's an autobiogra autobiography. And uh, there's this Republican leader, a man of freedom named Severola, and of course that's Winston Churchill. And there's this despot named Malara, and the despot's married to a beautiful woman named Lucille Light. And uh, come to find out whoever gets the state is gonna get the girl. Uh, Malara is unworthy of her. You lit majors will understand this. If Hillsdale College students don't understand this, then there's shame on them. They have a conversation around dinner time. Like the editor of my book tried to make me take that out. And I referred him to the English department, what I'm about to tell you. And they're having this dinner and the, the, the despot says, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Whatever you think it is, that's what it is. And. Uh, his wife, Lucille, the beautiful Lucille, intervenes and says, oh wait though, aren't there like some people who are very beautiful? And her husband, in a stupid insult to this beautiful woman, says, no, it's just what we think, right? Fashion is all. Shows he's unworthy of her, but also think of the power that he's considering to hold over nature, that he becomes the standard by which things like beauty are defined. No more looking up at something awesome and wishing to serve it for the greatness it contains. And this boy, Winston Churchill, writing this novel, has the hero intervene and says, okay, fashion is something, but look at that statue over there. And he points at a replica of a Greek statue. He says, for 2,000 years we have called that beautiful. Doesn't that indicate something more serious? There's a third contestant for the girl. It's a socialist whose name is spelled Carl with a K. And they go to a speech by the Savrola, who's a very great speaker, of course. And, uh, and he, uh, as they're walking out, Lucille is there hooded to hear the speech. She's already being wooed by Savrola. And uh, she overhears the socialist and he says, he's a good tool, but what does he understand of the community of property? And then his comrade, who's later killed at the end of the novel, says, or the community of wives. I'd like to have the president's wife. And she shudders. 
You see, there's three kinds of regimes and there's three people who might get the girl. In one kind, the power of the leader is all. In one kind, every good thing is shared equally among everybody. In the third kind, there are families and property and limited rule and representative government. That's the drama. Later, Churchill repeats this theme in his early speeches against socialism. And sure enough, you know, the socialists come into power, what do they say? In 1876, the Fabian essays are uh, published by George Bernard Shaw and Sidney Webb and the people who started the Fabian movement. And I think, I say in my book, that, uh, that that book is authoritative about the early British socialism in the way the Federalist Papers are for America, for the Constitution. And what do they say in there? They knew Karl Marx. He lived in London for a long time, and many of them knew him. And Karl Marx said, you have to abolish the, the, the family. They're vi he was violently against it. Because the women and children in the family are the wage slaves of the wage slaves. But the Fabians say in the beginning, no, no, we're not for that at all. But then they talk about it quite a bit as the essays go on. And they say, for example, it's very inefficient for small groups to have dining arrangements inside their own homes. And they say that we have to lay the economic basis so everybody, man, woman, and child, has the same income. And if you think about it for a minute, that's a fact, isn't it? Like, I'm very proud of my upbringing. I married Penny, you know, who comes from a very old family in England, and so I'm proud of that. After all, I wooed her. But, uh, and, her, and her people are very noble, right? Whereas on my side, we're a bunch of mongrels. We don't know where we came from. There's even some prospect we used to be Jews. We think that would be cool because it's kind of exotic. And you know, a little town in Arkansas. But I had this great gift, see. My dad was a school teacher and there were books around and people read them. A lot of people don't get that advantage. And how's that equal? I didn't do anything to deserve that. Other people are born rich. Some are born without parents. Are we ever really gonna equalize the society until we get rid of the family, which by the way, right now, we are bidding fair to do? Isn't the society always to be unequal in the start of the race of life until you do that and equalize property too? In fact, don't the same things, go, the two things go together? Tempted to say as man and wife? That's what Churchill thought. And he was driven to a conclusion about that. If you do that, then the people who raise the kids are gonna own them. Whereas parents don't own them, they own us. The motive when we raise them is love. Tonight, one of mine called and had a crisis. And I said, Lord, boy, I'm busy today. I had to go to Pittsburgh and I got to give a big talk tonight. Can't you have this crisis tomorrow? And his response was, no, I need you tonight. <laughs> I said, okay, what is it, right? You know, anybody else called except one of our other children and my wife and I would have said, shut up, talk tomorrow. They own us. But in this other way, you know, if we were going to raise them all the same, it would be a different spirit behind their raising but you could more commonly get it done. And if you're not gonna do that, then the society is going to be to some extent unfair. Churchill knew that. And when you read his arguments about socialism, they are deep and they are aware that if we stick with the free market system and limited government, we're not gonna perfect the society. It's just that they're gonna make it worse, subhuman. Because the sources of inequality in us are stubborn and they have their effect even in an open society where the free market works and where government is limited and where people can have the best chance to rise and there's the most mobility. He was on to that when he was 26 years old and he never lost it. See what else I have for conclusions. Third 
conclusion is uh, this war became virulent in Churchill's time as has never been seen before. You forget it, but politics did too. This is the age of totalitarianism. Its uh, latest uh, form is in the Islamic countries. Um, there, you know, did you read when uh, our conquest, maybe temporary conquest of liberation of Afghanistan, one of the most telling testimonies was uh, a young man whose family had been held hostage by the Taliban, and his job was to walk in the daytime among the people looking for people who had their beards the wrong length or their coats the wrong length, and at night walk among the neighborhoods and listen for sounds of music playing or television or card playing. And he would report them and then they'd be hauled off to the pokey and tortured because they were re revolutionizing the society, see. Well, what happened in the Soviet Union? What happened in Nazi Germany? What was it like? What it was like was you were afraid of your own children because you were not in charge of their education and in their schools they were taught to turn on you and turn you in. And that means in your conversations with your wife at the dinner table, you had to mind your tongue. And the body counts were in the tens of millions, hundreds of millions under communism worldwide. And Churchill saw that, watched it grow, feared it, and thought something very radical. Because, you know, it's odd if you go back through the history of the 20th century to find a statesman who was equally appalled by the totalitarianism of the right and the totalitarianism of the left. And Churchill was. He once said, uh, they differ as the North Pole differs from the South. And if you think about it, those two places are very far apart. But you can't tell the difference when you're there. But then he also said this thing, see, because analyze what he meant by socialism, what, what he thought socialism meant. In other words, to get the perfect equality that they're after, the central things about human nature had to be expunged and some other standard which we contrive replacing it. And Churchill said, so I'll tell you, he said things like this all his life. And today, historians write about this dramatic one I'm going to tell you about as if it's like a one-off thing. Um, but he said it many times, including both before and after this, in some cases decades before. In 1945, in the 1945 election, Churchill had become something he'd never been. He was the greatest man in the world. The way everybody talked to him, you know, look what he'd done. You know, and those speeches that he gave, they were just awesome. And he'd stuck it out in 1940, and he had enormous prestige. And he never lost it. And so the Times of London wrote a, as a editorial, a leading article. And they said that what he should do is he should be the elder statesman now and rise above party politics and just lead the country sort of above the party, con the party differences. So here's what he did instead. He gave a speech about socialism. And see, he's the man now, right? He said, uh, the Socialist Party could not realize its ultimate aims without the use of a secret police. Yes, I mean a Gestapo. Now, these guys in the Socialist Party had been his wartime comrades. And the leaders among them, including especially Clement Attlee, had tremendous World War I fighting records. They were patriotic people. And he says in there, they would not mean that. Horrified by the idea of it. But these principles, you see, that's where they're going to go. And that means that all these fears that he had of war, it's not just true that they are equal to the fears he had about the direction of peacetime politics, and not just in the totalitarian countries, but the principles being similar in the free countries they would eventually lead there too. And that means, by the way, that Winston Churchill lived his whole life thinking like that. 
And yet it's odd about him because he was cheerful and hilarious and determined and brave and eloquent and extremely productive year by year by year by year for over 50 years. These forces are so huge. And you know, once you figure out that he identified them in the turn of the century, in about 1900, a little before, and then you look about the world you today, he got beat in big ways. Looks like he failed. And you could think that it's hopeless, couldn't you? But I'll close with these two points. The first one is, he thought he knew what to do about it. He thought he knew what to do, and he thought he knew why that was bound to be doable sooner or later. What to do? If you think about it for a minute, if war is getting out of hand, then the, then the solution is strategy, which just means, you know, it comes from a Greek word that means a big area, but it's also the word for a general. And it means, having a plan to prevent war, if possible, and control its effects to the maximum extent possible. If you go read his Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri in 1946, you'll see what I regard as the, the most brilliant articulation of a strategy for the nuclear age anybody has ever given. It's awesome. But there would need to be some parallel in peace, wouldn't there? Some way to go about approaching politics in this age where scientific administration is growing very fast and the idea is that people can be altered fundamentally and that becomes a purpose of the government, see? And his idea about that was constitutionalism. He had a big plan. What did he think it was like? What he thought was, those are big rules to which people are loyal, and they last a long time. And they both empower the government because the government needs to have a lot of power, but also they restrain it. And how do they restrain it? And here's the really amazing thing about him. And it's, by the way, it's also amazing that this guy who fought all these wars in his famous form, he thought about this all his life and he wrote a lot about it. And what he thought was the first element of constitutionalism is we pick the government. And do you see how that requires a constitution? Because in Hitler, you know, that's what Hitler demanded. It's, it's why he got asked to be Chancellor of Germany three times before he accepted, because he had a condition. I won't do it unless we waive the constitution and I can do whatever I want. And if one person is going to run everything, then you don't need any rules. But if everybody's going to be involved, then there have to be forms or patterns by which they do it. Representative government requires constitutionalism. Look what's going on in the world today. The forums don't matter. They just do what they want. Churchill was afraid of that. But then the second thing is power needs to be divided. The progressives of Churchill's time, the fathers of the politics that we have today in America, they loved the British Constitution because they thought it set up a unified government without checks and balances or separation of powers. Churchill disagreed with that violently. In fact, he thought the House of Commons, although it is the place that picks the executive and the executive branch senior leaders are members of the House of Commons, that's the place where we control them because we're right there with them and we're debating them every week and we can watch everything we do. And then, you know, Churchill proposed reforms to the British government which would make it more like ours. He proposed federalism, he proposed bicameralism. He wanted to make the House of Lords into a body exactly like our Senate originally was, except picked by the members of the House of Commons, so indirectly elected by the people. He wanted to make the government with more checks and balances in it, just like ours. And you see, if this guy who has a hundred year record of seeing these trends in war and peace, and that's what he came up with, and then the people 150 years before him in America, that's what they came up with? I'm just saying, aw shucks, there might be something to it. I'll close with this. Why 
did Churchill think that Hitler could be beaten in 1940? Because you know, in 1940, the British were alone. They had six or eight divisions. The Germans had hundreds. They had air superiority. Britain had a bigger navy, but it looked like the Air Force was what really mattered, as it proved it was. Why did he, and you know, when you were around him in 1940, he didn't, partic he didn't, he didn't entertain any talk of stalemate. He said, we're going to go to Berlin and we're going to kill him. He needs killing and we're appointed to do it. We're going to go do that thing. And you know, they did. Why did he think that was possible? Why did he think that these waves of government strengthening and awesome authority that have been going on now since before his time and continue to pace today, why did he think that could be stopped? Well, come to find out, like everything else about him, he explained. He was always writing stuff down. I read a book the other day, he wrote, in 1931. This is the year in which Brave New World was published, although we know that he didn't read that book because he wrote a letter to his wife about it when he did read it until 1958. He said, uh, we're going to get the power to make people in laboratories. And we can make them either better or worse. We can breed them, as it were, so that they're good for thought or they're good for toil. Just like Brave New World, in April last year, two Nobel Prize winning biologists said that we should have a moratorium in the Wall Street Journal editorial on changing the germline DNA. Because well, once we change it, human nature will be an artifact. That is like something we make. And just as we can remove some birth defects, it looks like now, and then more later, no reason why we couldn't improve what's there, and if we could improve what's there, no reason why we couldn't diminish what's there. And then, you know, all these problems of inequality that are so stubborn, maybe they could be diminished by people being happier with their station. But the trouble with that is we would start looking at each other like something we made. You know, that silly boy who called me tonight, I don't know what I look at him like, but uh, I don't, look like, I don't look at him like something I made. <laughs> He's, I don't know who made him, but he, whoever it was gave him to me. <laughs> and he's okay, right? And he's mine. He owns me. That's what that means. Churchill said that along with that development, then, we could make a race that new pleasures all the time that are beyond anything any of us has ever experienced. And we could live as long as we want. And living as long as we want, we could go anywhere we want to go, including interplanetary. He's describing that we could live like gods. I'll tell you what he said about that, but before I do, I'll just tell you this. There was an exact partner to that, because in 1932, he wrote a book called uh, an essay called Mass Effects in Modern Life. And in that essay, he wrote the gloomiest paragraph he ever wrote. He says that the Russian Bolsheviks would reduce us, he says, to the, to the situation of the white ant. In other words, it's a rule that will treat people like insects. And he says that's only an extreme form of the doctrines that we have in the Western countries. Do you get the impression that this is a really thoughtful guy for a politician? Because I'm telling you, I assert that these themes are consistent right through his life. It's very extraordinary. And then he says in the next paragraph, one of the most hopeful things he ever says. But you know, he says, human nature is not as tractable as ant nature. It is at once the glory and the safeguard of mankind that it is easy to lead and hard to drive. In 2000, when Broadbeck and his guys came to see me about coming to work here, somebody said to me, how'd you learn about management? And I said, well, it doesn't count. Peter Drucker was my landlord. Uh, uh, they were all very impressed with that. I actually knew him very well, although I never studied with him. And, 
I said, what did count was I've made a lot of mistakes and I try not to make them twice. And also I studied Winston Churchill and Mr. Pearson, one of them said, what did you learn from him? And I said, easy to lead and hard to drive. Churchill thought that isn't going to go away. And do you know what he thought about this perfect society where we could all live as long as we want, have all the pleasure we want, and have all the servants we want, and the servants all be happy to serve us all we want. And even if we got picked to be in the servant class, we would be content like cows. That's the image. And that's possible. Except for this, he says. What was the good of all that to them? What did they know more than we know about the answers to the simple questions which man has asked since the earliest dawn of reason? Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? Whither are we going? No material progress, even though it takes shapes we cannot now conceive, or however it may expand the faculties of man, can bring comfort to his soul. It is this fact, more wonderful than any science can reveal, which gives the best hope that all will be well. In other words, when Winston Churchill fought those wars at home and abroad, he was fighting for a being that he thought was built by God to be free, and that no act of man could efface that. You should study him. Thank you. Immediately following this session, Dr. Arn has agreed to sign copies of his new book, Churchill's Trial, on the other side of this curtain. We now have time for a few questions. That book's not very good, but you can have a signed copy. Also, uh, I should announce, it's, uh, Mr. Schlintz told me today that it's in the top 10 in all categories on Amazon, and so I hasten to point out that any money I'm paid for that book will come to the college. <laughs> I expect to be arrested because of that by the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you characterized Churchill's The World Crisis as his second greatest book. Uh, what do you regard as his greatest? Uh, Marlboro, His Life and Times. They're all good, but that's about an ancestor, the greatest English journal, uh, general, and it contains this passage. Uh, He's describing how you understand soldiers. And so all that stuff about prudence that I said, come to find out Churchill was very thoughtful about that. He wrote a lot about it, and it tends to be beautiful. And about that, he's describing how these generals are really good. And we underestimate them, or we misestimate them because we don't see what the problem is. He says, uh, it's actually pretty simple what can happen in a war. If you're a general, you don't actually have very many options, right? You can stay where you are, you can retreat, you can go to either side, or you can advance. And so, whichever one he picks, if he loses, then everybody writes up how silly that was, he should have picked the other one. And that's what, you know, if you read, that's, that's what war stories read like. Unless, by the way, they're written by Tom Connor, who's, uh, I've heard him tell many, and he's got a book coming out, but he knows better than that. So, uh, so, Churchill says, in fact, they have to decide at the time, in the face not just of the qualitative information, but the quantities. And they're shifting all the time. How many are here? How far is that? How much weight is this? And it's always changing. And then he says, nothing but genius, the daimon in man, can answer the riddles of war. And because genius is much rarer than the rarest and purest of diamonds, wars are mainly tales of muddle. So the book that that's in, because that's Winston Churchill's best, best explanation, I argue, of himself. 
and also the answer I give people when they ask me, why isn't there a Winston Churchill around? The answer is, there almost never is. But there is one we can read about. Yes, Reverend. Good evening, Dr. Arn. The CCA, we've concentrated on Winston Churchill's first prim ministership. I was wondering if you could comment on his second one. At that time, Britain had turned to socialism, and Churchill was prime minister a second time at a crucial point in Britain's history. I was just wondering if you could comment on the political struggles of that time and whether you believe Winston Churchill was successful in his confrontation with socialists in Britain. Uh, that's Josiah back there. Uh, he's a show pony. Um, so, uh, <laughs> he does an excellent interpretation of Barack Obama. You should ask him to do it. Um, so the answer is, he, he won in 1951, and he didn't serve very long, and he was old by that time. And he had a very thin majority. So what they did do was denationalize the steel industry, which he promised to do, and not the others. Uh, more interesting about the domestic policy questions are how he ran the campaigns, and the theme of both of them was socialism versus the people. And he made the case that, uh, that uh, what they're going to do, he said, uh, one of the things he said is, they've actually appointed a bureaucracy that forms an army larger than any peacetime bureaucracy, army, any peacetime army Britain has ever had. And he counted up the numbers. Uh, historians make a point that sometimes he said one number and sometimes another. But uh, his idea was, this is all, aimed at you, see, and, and, his, and he would explain and say, that's, you know, what do I think politicians ought to do today? I think they ought to do exactly this. I think they should make the point that if, if you believe it, and I happen to, that uh, there's some danger that the government is going to overwhelm the people, then you will find in his speeches how to explain that, and he did win with that argument. My kids are asking questions. Thank you for a good synopsis, um, Dr. Arn. In Churchill's views post-war and how the society was developing, along with mankind's traits, and I was reminded it seemed to be a, a parallel there between what uh, Churchill was saying, as well as some of the early artists, uh, we had just seen a silent film by Fritz Lang in the early Germany, uh, the Metropolis, and it was espousing this very same fear that without internal moral guidance that mankind could destroy itself. Do you see many parallels between Churchill and the arts of the time? Oh yeah, he did too. Um, he, so he liked that movie. He liked movies in general, but he liked that movie. And uh, he watched movies all the time. Uh, it's a vice to cultivate, um, but try to find good ones. Um, and and uh, he liked uh, poems, and he liked novels, and he liked uh, and knew several of the best uh, poets who wrote poems, especially about the First World War. After the Second World War, he was very old. But after the First World War, R.C. Sheriff and went to his play called uh, Journey's End. Isn't that right? Richard R.C. Sheriff wrote that play. And, uh, and he knew him, and that was a guy who fought in the trenches. And uh, so the dehumanization of war was a great theme with Churchill. Now, Churchill was no, Churchill was a painter. And uh, he's a good painter, in my opinion. Uh, there are two things in the world that I want that I can't afford. Uh, and one of them is one of Churchill's paintings. It belongs to Brad Pitt right now. But, um, and you know, he's richer than I am. Um, but um, he liked bright, vivid paintings. And he liked, you know, he, he couldn't match the masters, but he did the Impressionist. And so the stark, nihilistic paintings of more modern times, he didn't like those. But he saw, the, he saw the point, 
and uh, it's, it's worth making the point, by the way. What is the claim? The claim is this. Here's the story of human history in the modern account. A uh, long time ago, there were these weak little beings without much hair on them, and they weren't very fast, and it's a miracle they survived. It's just that they were great contrivers. And so they invented tools, and they used them, and they go watch the beginning of the movie 2001, for example. God is the thing that brings us technology. Uh, and then they start conquering nature. And they conquer and conquer and conquer. Until now, they're getting to the place where they can even conquer nature in themselves. And uh, we have to turn and see. It wasn't scientists, you know, natural scientists who made this argument. It was social scientists, a new discipline invented to mimic the natural sciences. And its point was we have to use the tools of natural science to govern human society because then we can get to work on it and we can perfect it. And that's what Churchill saw. And also, I should tell you, he's not alone in that. Churchill had a contemporary in C.S. Lewis, whom we study around here a lot, a lot of us do. Churchill offered him a CBE and he turned it down with a charming letter. And there are two other letters he wrote in which he mentions the letter, the elections in 50 and 51, where Churchill's running against the socialists and he's explicit that he's pulling to turn the socialists out. But Lewis's point, especially in his essay, Abolition of Man, and in his novel, which he says is written along the same things, that hideous strength, his point is that the power of man over nature is only expressed as the power of some men over others. So that's what's going on in the world. And you're right, it's reflected in art, and Churchill saw that. Although he didn't put it in his own paintings. We have time for one more question. Yeah, who are you to be deciding that? <laughs> my, name is, my name is Chris Pudence, and Stevan, Stevan here and I were talking. Um, and we were wondering if you could um, comment on how differently the onset of the Cold War might have looked had Churchill taken, had the world taken Churchill's distrust of Stalin more seriously. Thank you. Uh, well, the decision points there were in 1943 and 44. And uh, in general, there was a big uh, strategic argument uh, among uh, the Americans among uh, Roosevelt and his team and Churchill and his team. And on several key occasions, Churchill wanted the British and American forces to thrust farther east through the Mediterranean. And they wanted to take as much ground as far east and north as possible from Italy inwards. And he definitely had in mind the idea that that would prevent Stalin from having so much. Uh, it wasn't the only idea. Churchill was in favor of the, uh, of the invasion through France, too, northern France. He was very much against the second Western invasion that happened through Marseille, and they came to words over that. And there were two times that I know of that, uh, and we're doing these document volumes now, so I probably would know, but, uh, um, there are two times that I know of when Churchill came to very candid words about this. And uh, one of them was in 1943, when Stalin was informed that there wouldn't be a second front in that year. And he really lambasted, lambasted Churchill and Roosevelt for that. And Churchill got cranky about it. And he said, of course they want us to put all our forces in northern France such a distance from all that territory they're taking in Eastern Europe. So you can see that's on his mind, right? And then in 1944, when they did do the Marseille invasion, and he fought hard against that, and he, uh, that was the hardest, uh, bitterest, uh, most vehement, I guess you'd say, argument he had with Roosevelt. And I don't want to exaggerate how much he and Roosevelt differed. They did differ a lot about these subjects. And toward the end, Roosevelt sort of petered out. You know, he was very ill and he died in 1945. And, uh, and so he, uh, he wasn't a factor. But Churchill 
says, I lodge a solemn protest about this decision. And then, darned if he didn't up and fly himself to Moscow and make a deal with Stalin without Roosevelt. And it's a very dramatic meeting, it's called, it's famous, it's called the percentages deal. And, uh, and it's, uh, I, I think it is very clear what Churchill was up to. Churchill would go over and see Stalin and they both stayed up late at night and they both drank a lot, uh, although Stalin drank more than Churchill and it's a myth that Churchill was drunk. Hardly ever he hated it. I don't know, I, I actually think he probably was never drunk, but for sure very seldom. But uh, they drank and talked and Churchill would make big toast and bawl like a baby about the future, he, he called himself a blubber baby, about the future of the Russian and the British and the American peoples, right? And then this one is all different because they sit across the table and there's a British note, note taker, a major, sitting at the table taking notes and there are translators in the room. And Churchill says, I brought this document. And uh, Stalin says, yes, he says, it's a naughty document. I think we should destroy this document. I'm going to show it to you. And Stalin, you know, Stalin's a great conspirator, right? Churchill never talked to him like that, didn't talk to people like that in general. And what it is, is it, it says, in the land that's taken, liberated by the allies east and west, who gets what percentage authority over what country? And there's one country that Britain can get to on its own with its navy, not needing any landing craft, and that's Greece. And Britain gets 90% authority in Greece. And then they're leaving, the meeting is breaking up. But it, Stalin says at one point, shouldn't we have Averill Harriman, the American ambassador, who's come with Churchill from London in these meetings? And Churchill replies, and see, this is a very unusual thing for Churchill. Churchill replies, well, he should be in many of our meetings but we have some things to talk about in this meeting. I don't know that we could tell the Americans about this, he says. The Americans he's just quarreled with about where this next front will be. So, uh, so Churchill says to him, uh, I'm going down to Athens now. And uh, Stalin says, uh, good, and he says, somebody should talk to those people down there. And uh, Stalin says, well, I don't know them. And Churchill says, well, somebody should. And Stalin says, well, maybe I could get them a message. And Churchill says, you might hurry. <laughs> and, and he goes down to Athens, and you know, what happened in the battle was that the capital was surrounded by communist forces, and they were interrupted when they were near taking the whole capital by a British army that came in there. So I think he was thinking about that in the post-war world, and I think he had very distinct views about it. Uh, he didn't like communism, and uh, I think he was right not to. I don't, I don't think, by the way, that the differences in the United States, Tom Connor will probably know more about this than I do, I don't think his differences with the United States were, uh, uh, chiefly, I don't know what that means. I know that, that there are causes of the United States looking at this differently than just that they were more tolerant or they liked communism better than Churchill did, although Alger Hiss was a senior American official. That, that's true. But there was another thing too, and George Marshall said things like this. If you're sitting in Washington, D.C., the world looks different than if you're sitting in London. And so from his point of view, we've got to get to Berlin, and if you draw a straight line from us to Berlin, it, it goes right through northern France. We should go that way. And Churchill's idea was very different than that, and I think more sophisticated than that, but they thought too sophisticated. And so there's a real argument in the middle of this, not just an ideological difference. Thanks. Thank you.